Season 2 of The Mandalorian is a completely different beast from the first. In many ways, it improves on the first season by taking steps forward, but it also takes steps back that I think are pretty significant. This video was difficult for me to figure out how to structure because I'm still not sure how best to convey my points about it. I think that it's important that before we proceed, I mention some things that I should have talked about in my Season 1 review. The main thing that I did for this review that I should have done for the previous one is that I watched all the gallery episodes for Season 1 on Disney+, Plus, which provide a really good look at the whole process of making this show. It really demonstrates how much the creators cared about making the show good, and gives you a closer look at how much time, energy, and most importantly, effort was put into making The Mandalorian. The blend of practical and visual effects in the new Star Wars movies has always been impressive, but John Favaro and the other creators pushed the boundaries of this aspect with the creation of new technology for the show. Instead of relying on a lot of green or blue screen, or a lot of on-location filming, they instead utilized what they call the volume, which is pretty much a large set with a gigantic LED screen displaying backgrounds behind them. This is much better than relying on green screen or something like that, especially because of how time consuming it would be to remove the green screen from characters like Mando. A ton of stuff that looks like it was done in post was actually done right there on the set. The practical effects in particular are extremely impressive. Baby Yoda is a puppet in most of the scenes that he's in, yet his movements are so realistic that even the actors thought that he was a real character. Probably the best and the weirdest moment was in when I was shooting three, and I was doing a scene in the safe house with Werner and the baby, and it was like one of the weirdest and best things that ever happened, where Werner, he was acting against the baby, which was, you know, the puppet, obviously, and I think at some point he forgot that it was a puppet, and he got so into the baby that he started directing the baby directly as though he was talking to a person. <laughs> and so I'm trying to direct Werner, who's now directing the puppet, and the puppeteers seem to, he doesn't realize the puppeteers are actually the ones. And so, and then he you fell in love with more. it. And he then did. Jason Porter and I, like when we went to do the plate shot, he basically like, was like t calling us cowards and telling us that we needed to commit to the magic and don't give them the plate shot, make them use the puppet. <laughs> it was it was amazing. By like, it, was... it turns out he was right. Because he was right. <laughs> he was right. We oh, used no. the puppet all the everything. Know. And even yeah. when we have a CG version of it, we have them match what the puppet could do. Yeah. yeah. We don't have them do things that the puppet can't do. Something that I think the creators do a much better job at explaining than I did was the fan service on the show. I was partially right about it, but they deliver a much more logical reason as to why it works. But to me, it's just using the universe that was created. It's not taking it in a different direction. It's not just throwing a term in there for the sake of winking, saying, see, I get it. That's something that takes practice. And I personally think that this is a much more effective way of incorporating fan service into Star Wars. It's more logical and organic than just having a fan favorite character show up for no reason. The gallery episodes really reinforced by the first season is as well made as it is. And I wish I had incorporated that into my season one review. But now let's move on to talking about the improvements and shortcomings of season two. Also, there will be spoilers from here on out, so proceed with caution. The biggest improvement this season is that the story is much more solid. The plot of the first season is about a bounty hunter whose life changed upon encountering a bounty that was different from the others, and his mission to protect it at any cost, even if it meant going against his own creed or employers. The plot of the first season, while simple and easy to follow, lost its steam around the middle. This began with episode 4, and by the time we got to episode 6, I was starting to lose focus and wondering when we'd be getting back to the main story. Now, I understand why those episodes are there. It's to show Mando on the run from the Bounty Hunters Guild, and how he's not going to be able to rest easy until something is done about the client. I've said before that this show has no bad episodes, just ones that are weaker than others. To me, there wasn't really anything in these three episodes that compared with the third episode, which was my favorite episode of that season. Season 2, on the other hand, has a more streamlined plot. Mando needs to get Baby Yoda to the Jedi, and all the episodes are the result of him trying to track one down. The plot didn't lose steam like how I did last season, which is a marked improvement. The general look of the show is much better. A problem I had with a lot of the earlier episodes in Season 1 was that a lot of them were pretty dark, so it was hard to make out details in some scenes, like the shootout between the Bounty Hunters Guild and the tribe in Episode 3. 
The lighting is much better this season, even in scenes where things are supposed to be darker. There's also more use of sets and green and blue screens, which you can see if you watch the gallery episode for this season. The blend of practical and visual effects is still really well done, and they really push the boundaries of what they could do in season 2. For example, the Dark Troopers are guys in suits who have had their joints edited out in post, and a lot of the shots of Moff Gideon's cruiser are of a physical model, similar to how they did shots of ships in the original trilogy. However, there are a few scenes in this season where the visual effects stick out like a sore thumb. The most egregious examples of this are in the season finale, like the shuttle crash or Luke's face. Oh my god, what's wrong with your face? But for the most part, this isn't really a problem. The music is still as fantastic as ever. I can't play large portions of it or I'll get copyright claims, but I recommend checking it out. This season handles character development very well for the most part. Mando is the character who grows the most this season, as he continues to build on his character development from the last one. If Season 1 used him as a window into Mandalorian culture, then Season 2 uses him to challenge the audience's perception of what a Mandalorian is. We've only really seen Mando interact with Mandalorians from his own culvert, so meeting characters like Bo-Katan or Boba Fett challenge whether or not the beliefs that have been drilled into him are right or not. This also plays into his greater arc throughout the show, by the end of the season, he has fully transitioned from a cold, ruthless bounty hunter into a hero that would risk his personal beliefs in order to save his kid. I'm personally not a big fan of how much he removed his helmet this season. I like the motif of a faceless character being the protagonist, conveying most of his emotion through his voice, which is something the creators also discuss in the gallery episodes. However, I acknowledge that him removing his helmet is justified within the story, because it shows how much he's grown as a character. I also liked how they challenged the public perception of Baby Yoda, or Grogu as we have to call him now. They contrasted the really cutesy scenes of him from the first season with him doing things like stealing or committing genocide. Grogu's struggle with the dark side isn't something that I was expecting them to expand more on this season, but they did a really good job at making it stand out from similar struggles that other Jedi have. Instead of throwing tantrums or making messes, when Grogu gets upset, he decides it's time to murder people. I think the creators did a really good job on expanding the two's relationship, so it really does tug on your heartstrings when Grogu ultimately decides to go with Luke. However, I can't really say that character development was done too well with the other recurring characters from Season 1. Cara Dune is the most prominent of these returning characters, but they don't really use her for anything outside of action scenes or being the voice of reason. There is some development with her readjusting to society, exemplified by her becoming the local marshal, but the most development that she gets is people harassing her about her tragic past. Like, oh, you're from Alderaan, huh? How does that make you feel? Are you sad? Are you sad because all your loved ones are dead? Do you cry yourself to sleep at night because everyone you ever knew or loved is now nothing but a space dust? <laughs> Most of the characters are kind of just there. Grief Karga had an interesting character change in the last season. He was mainly a villain in that season because he was attempting to survive the Imperial occupation, and so he had to get dirty by working with the Bounty Hunters Guild. But throughout the course of that season, he slowly becomes a better person, to where he reassumes his position as the Magistrate of Navarro. But he doesn't really have anything to do this season, other than look like Mithral's unfunny comedic antics has aged him a few years. Fennec is kinda just there to be cool and do badass things. There is very little that separates her from Cara Dune, other than her cybernetic tummy. <laughs> Mithral is probably my least favorite character this season. In the first season, it was kind of funny to have the stereotypical comic relief character just be yeeted from the show in the first episode, but there was nothing about him that justified his return here. In this season, he's pretty much just there to get bullied around by grief, and most of the time it's more pathetic than funny. You've got two choices. Take us in and I knock a hundred years off your debt. Or? Or I leave you out here in the lava flats to walk home with whatever's left in your humidity vest. Not much of a choice, is it? Not funny. Didn't laugh. I think the secondary character that had the most improvement this season was Mix Mayfield, which is surprising because I thought he was the least interesting character in the episode that I thought was the weakest last season. Before episode 7 of this season, I pretty much remembered him more for his cool robot arm backpack thingy than anything he really did in that episode. The episode that he's in this season explored his ideology and the reason why he acts the way he does, and actually made him a compelling character. 
Mayfield's confrontation with his former superior was one of my favorite parts this season, and tying his defection from the Empire to Operation Cinder works in a way that doesn't work in Battlefront 2, but we'll talk more about that in my next video. I hope that we see more of him in the next season, but with the way that his character exited the show, I don't think we'll be seeing him again. To round this section off before moving on, I want to discuss the way that this season uses the Imperial Remnant that Moff Gideon leads. I mentioned in my Season 1 review that I liked that the show made the Imperial characters intimidating, and I hoped that they continued to use this in Season 2. Now did they do that? Mm, not really. I think we have them trapped, sir. Trapped them where? In the cargo control area. Where? In the cargo control area. To be completely fair though, they still kept individual Imperial characters intimidating. Multiple characters this season have the writing and acting chops to make their characters come across as threatening or at the very least very nasty and despicable people. A lot of people mentioned that in particular Valen Hess is reminiscent of Quentin Tarantino characters, and while I'm not too familiar with his films, I can agree that Hess's actor did a really good job at making him be despicable. The Fitness Gram Pacer Test is a multi-stage aerobic capacity test. <laughs> Speaking of which, the humor that is done with Imperial characters is still funny, as I have to admit that leading into the way that the Empire is perceived in pop culture is just as funny as it was in the last season. I think the only episode that tries to get back to the perception that we had about the Empire in the show is in episode 7, where you really see how Imperial remnants like Gideon's are barely being kept together. Seeing the random mishmash of troopers and officers having to work together more frequently than we do in other things really drives home to the point that the Empire is on their way out. Unfortunately, for the most part, when Imperial characters show up this season, it's so a character can look cool by slaughtering a ton of them, which is disappointing but not unexpected at this point. I think the main character that suffers from the way that the Imperial Remnant acts this season is Moff Gideon. Giancarlo Esposito's main strength as an actor is that he makes the characters that he plays intimidating through their dialogue, and we get that with Moff Gideon's introduction into the show. And even when he's not having an intimidating dialogue, his fight with Mando in the first season still comes across as really intense. This also continues into episode 8, which is the most we see of him this season. The main problem with him this time around is that he doesn't appear to be as intelligent as he was in the last season. For example, take a look at his standoff with Mando in the season 1 finale. The show states that Gideon was present during the Mandalorian Purge, so therefore, he knows about Beskar's ability to deflect blaster bolts that are under a certain caliber. So, instead of trying to shoot Mando directly, he shoots the ammo case for the E-Web cannon, incapacitating him for the time being. In spite of knowing this, however, in this season, he tries to shoot Bo-Katan, despite knowing that it won't accomplish anything. His duel with Mando is another good scene this season. It's clear that he doesn't really have that much formal lightsaber training, but what he does have is all this aggression that Giancarlo is able to translate very well into the characters he plays. Moff Gideon is not a master swordsman. He's, he, he feels more like a bureaucrat, but what he does have is he has the dark saber in his possession, and he also has this rage. And we almost got into trouble by running through too many prop and <laughs> dark sabers. Josh, the prop master, was, uh, he wasn't thrilled, but he was there, he was totally prepared, but Giancarlo just had this fury as he came in there, and it, it shows in the finished episode. So this scene at least somewhat makes up for him not being as much of a threat this time around. Now we're going to be looking at something that, in my opinion, was a real mixed bag this season. I'm talking, of course, about the fan service. Fan service in Star Wars is pretty common, and usually goes over pretty well. Most of the time, these fan service characters will have a logical reason for showing up in the story, but sometimes they show up for no other reason than the simple fact that fans lose their minds if a character they love shows up. What set the Mandalorian apart from other pieces of Star Wars media up until this point is that it actively avoided this type of fan service. Unlike something like Clone Wars or Rebels, the Mandalorian exists outside of the three main trilogies, so fan service characters showing up isn't as likely as it is in those shows. Instead, the creators focused on featuring familiar races, 
factions, vehicles, and planets that fans would know about and appreciate seeing again. I don't necessarily have a problem with the fan service this season. As I said in my season 1 review, that fan service has been ingrained into the fabric of the show. However, I think it's important to discuss the way that fan service has become a more prominent element in the show because of season 2. So we're going to be talking about the familiar faces that we see in the order that they appear in. Cobb Vanth was a character that I was not expecting that I would like before I watched this season. Cobb is a character from the Aftermath trilogy, a series of books that take place between episodes 6 and 7, which I have not read and probably never will. I couldn't even finish the first chapter of the first book, because the author, Chuck Wendig, chose to write it in a very unique way. Jean Favaro and Dave Filoni must have realized this because they pretty much insert Cobb's entire backstory into the episode he appears in. He's pretty much a simple western sheriff cliché. Which is fine because pretty much all the characters are presented as simple clichés that have more going on. It's interesting to see a character like him in the show. Cobb overcoming his hatred of sand people is an interesting callback to Mando overcoming his hatred of droids in the last season, and I would not complain if we saw more of him in season 3. Bo-Katan is an interesting character to put in The Mandalorian, because she's mainly been a secondary character in the majority of the Star Wars things she's appeared in, and I've never really had a good idea of what she's like as a character. The Mandalorian chose to depict her as a bitter asshole, and I mean, I can't blame her for acting this way. For example, take a look at all the stuff that happens to her in Clone Wars, like her mentor figure dying, or her sister dying, or being instrumental in a civil war that eventually leads to imperial occupation. It was under her brief rule as Mandalore that almost all Mandalorians were wiped out by the Empire, and it was also during this time that the Darksaber ended up in the hands of another outsider, so it's understandable that she'd act the way she does. That being said, it is kind of annoying how much of an ass she is towards other characters. So it's kind of satisfying when Mando accidentally becomes the next ruler of Mandalore instead of her. It will be interesting to see what they do with this plot point in the next season, and whether or not Bo will reassume her title as Mandalore. Ahsoka is kind of just there. I don't mind her being in the show, but I get the impression that she's only really there to set up other shows. I like how they use her past with Anakin as the main reason why she won't train Grogu. And I like the lone gunslinger slash Ronin vibe that she gives off in the show. It will be interesting to see where Ahsoka goes from here, and whether or not the Ahsoka show will pick up from where the Mandalorian leaves her. Boba is a character who I cannot really discuss it that much here since I'm planning on making a character analysis video on him in the same style as my Palpatine video, which I held off on making because I wanted to see what they do with him this season. What I can say about him right now is that I like the way that they used him in this, and I'm hyped for the Book of Boba Fett, where I hope they keep this up. And of course, I could not end this video without talking about Luke. I hate the fact that Luke is in the show. Now, before you crucify me in the comments section, let me explain that I understand why he shows up in The Mandalorian. He's one of the few Jedi that are still running around that could logically become Grogu's mentor, but he is still the most egregious piece of fan service in the season. Up until this point, it's pretty much been relatively minor characters that have shown up. The closest that it's gotten to this level is Ahsoka, but she's only a secondary protagonist, so it's not as bad. But having one of the protagonists of the Skywalker saga show up in The Mandalorian kind of ruins the whole self-contained story aspect that was one of the things that made the show so cool. The only reason why I don't completely dislike his appearance in the show is that it's a look at Luke in his prime, before he becomes the jaded mentor figure that we see in The Last Jedi, which is something that we've gotten bits and pieces of in canon, but not really to this extent. His hallway scene is a nice parallel to Vader's from Rogue One, so it was cool to see that at least. My only complaint with him, besides him being in the show at all, was his CGI monster face. That's actually Mark Hamill playing Luke, so they digitally de-aged his face. And somehow, his face looks about as good as Superman's from Justice League. I probably am harping on it too much, but I find it hilarious that deepfake YouTubers have been able to make Luke's face look much better for free than a TV show backed by Luke's film and Disney was able to do with the amount of resources that they had. Oh wait, I was completely wrong. Luke is the most egregious piece of fan service in the season. R2-D2 is. 
because he literally shows up so people can go. R2D2 showed up and I clapped! Season 2 of The Mandalorian challenged my perception of it in ways that I didn't think it would. While I still love the show and I think they took a ton of steps forward in spite of the places where they take steps back, I think that they've put themselves in a difficult position with the choices that they made in this season. I hope they remain true to what made the show appeal to so many people, which was drawing inspiration from things that inspired Lucas, relying more on visual storytelling, having it be disconnected from the majority of the main Star Wars trilogies, rather than just have the show devolve into a fanservice nightmare. I have confidence that the creators are smart enough to avoid this pitfall, but it's a slippery slope that Favaro and Filoni have decided to put themselves and their team on. So, to round out the video, I'm going to quickly rank all the episodes this season and give the season a score. Episode 1 is my favorite. It has all the show's strengths on display. Visual storytelling, good characters, great music, expanding on concepts from the original films, and references to the expanded universe. Episode 6 is a close second. People have talked about this having a lot of fan film vibes, and I choose to see this as a positive thing. I will never say no to more Boba Fett action scenes. I love the aesthetics of Episode 5. It had a ton of Western and Samurai vibes, a lot of them direct references to Kurosawa films. Episode 3 is just a really solid episode. Bryce Dallas Howard has improved a lot since he last directed for The Mandalorian, and while the episode from last season is by no means bad, it's a massive improvement. Episode 7 expands a lot on the Empire and Mayfield's character, so kudos to Rick Femuyiwa for that. Episode Spiders is solid as well. The CGI is well implemented, and I like how the New Republic just shows up to be assholes in this show. There aren't nearly enough spiders in this episode though. I should not have been able to see anything going on because of how many spiders there were. 5 out of 10. Episode 8 is mainly carried by the fan service, and once you watch the episode, I think you understand why. Episode 4 is probably the weakest overall. I like how it progresses the story and some of the action scenes, but there's nothing really memorable here. Carl Weathers has apparently directed stuff before, but this episode didn't really demonstrate any strengths that he might have as a director. Overall, I give Season 2 of The Mandalorian an 8 out of 10. It's a big improvement over the first, and I'm excited to see what they do in Season 3. I'm now going to dedicate my time to finishing my Battlefront 2 video, which will be out sometime in February. So I'll see you guys in the next video.